Number 12, how to read Acts. Acts is an extraordinary book worthy of your reading and attention. It says in Acts chapter 1, verse 1, in the first book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. Acts is Luke's second volume. So, for a fun reading project, read Luke and then Acts, one right after the other, and you'll see how they fit together very nicely. Within the book of Acts, there are a number of major historical events. I've outlined for you 16 of them here. Number one, we have Jesus commissioning his disciples. I'm going to come to that verse in just a moment. Acts 1.8, an extremely important verse for understanding the book of Acts. And then he ascends into heaven. So the first thing that happens in the book of Acts is Jesus leaves. So now what? Peter initiates replacing Judas. So they had, Judas had killed himself, so they're like, all right, we need another guy to replace Judas, and they figure that out in the, first, um, or the second half of chapter 1. Then the Spirit is poured out, that's the day of Pentecost, and Peter preaches, converting 3,000 people. Then in chapter 3, Peter and John heal a lame man, and Peter preaches, and 5,000 people believe then. And then we have this interesting section from chapter 4 through chapter 6, at least the beginning of chapter 6, which is just communal living in Jerusalem. And this is, this is a, uh, it has a lot of different stuff in here. Some of their struggles with Ananias and Sapphira, if you're familiar with that, and also just like what life was like for the earliest Christians as they're living in Jerusalem. Then we have Stephen's martyrdom. And that is really the hinge point of the book of Acts. Whereas before this, and including that, all of this is in Jerusalem and the general vicinity of Jerusalem. Once we get past Stephen's martyrdom, it's it's everywhere else. I mean, we do take a trip to Jerusalem in chapter 15, but like other than that, the action is elsewhere. Number seven Uh, is uh, Philip's expansion to Samaria and Ethiopia. So now we start to see this idea of expansion. And Acts is all about expansion, expansion to a new location. It's sort of like like opening a new franchise, you know, like expansion, 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 grow, grow, grow. This is the book of Acts. Then Paul is converted, and we have an expansion to Damascus. It's, It's incredible. All the way up in Damascus and Syria, there are Christians there. And Paul's like, I want to go persecute these people. Right? So the, the priest says, all right, go ahead, go. Per-. And then, of course, uh, Paul gets converted to become one of them himself. But then we don't actually switch to Paul yet. We're still really focused on Peter. Acts chapter 9, the second half, is Peter's mission to Lydda and Joppa, which is uh, major cities in Judea. Then in chapter 10, Peter converts, and 11, Peter converts Cornelius in Caesarea. Then in chapter 11, Barnabas brings Paul to Antioch, and it's kind of a brief little snippet. So we're still not really ready to switch to Paul yet. Then we go back to Peter in chapter 12, Peter's arrest and miraculous escape. Then we finally switch to Paul, and we stay on Paul for the rest of the book. So chapter 12, Paul begins his first missionary journey. Chapter 16, he begins his second missionary journey. Chapter 19, he begins his third missionary journey. And then at the end of that, he gets arrested. And there's a fourth journey, but it's not a missionary journey. It's a uh, transportation of an arrested, accused person to get to trial in Rome. But it is Paul, so it's kind of similar. Now, if we look at all 28 chapters of Acts at once, what we can see is that there's a couple ways to really... To, to really think about this. And one of those ways is to say, all right, well, the first, let's see here. The first 12 major points here, the first half, really, of the book of Acts, chapters 1 through 12, the focus is mostly Peter. And then the focus of the second half of the book of Acts is mostly Paul. Now, Paul does have a couple of 
parts early in Peter's section, right? But generally is Peter and the Jerusalem believers is the main focus. So that's one way to think about it. Another way to think about it is to look at this verse here, Acts 1.8, and say, but just Jesus, this is Jesus speaking. He says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So this starts in Jerusalem, moves to Judea, then Samaria, and then the ends of the earth. That's the whole book of Acts right there. Look at that. So we start in Jerusalem. And we stay in Jerusalem for about six, seven chapters. And then it's like, all right, persecution. Let's get out of here. So now they move to Samaria. And then we also get some incidents of Peter doing missionary work in Judea. So we hit Judea and Samaria, kind of out of order, but, you know, very near each other in time. And then it's to the ends of the earth. And that's Paul the Apostle. He is the missionary that just, he's like the old Energizer Bunny commercials. He keeps going and going and going, and he cannot be stopped. Within the book of Acts, there are four main emphases. One is the leading and the experience of God's Spirit. Another is the rapid expansion through conversion. And then perseverance through persecution. And then lastly, respect of authorities. These are not the only topics in the book of Acts, but these are special emphases that I want to look at with you. So the first one up there is the uh, leading and experience of God's Spirit. And we we see this in a lot of places. The book of Acts is a Spirit-saturated book. So oftentimes the Spirit of God is described as if it were a liquid. You can be baptized in it. You can have it poured on you. You can be filled with it. You know, these are kind of metaphor. Obviously, the Spirit is not a liquid, but it's, it's spoken of using that kind of language. Um, or you could just be very neutral, say, receive the Spirit. So you can see it's all over the book of Acts. Then you have manifestations of the Spirit, speaking in tongues and prophecy throughout the book of Acts. Then you have exorcisms as casting out unclean spirits. <coughs> It doesn't just happen once or twice. It happens quite a few times in the book of Acts. And then there are healing and miracles. Wow, look at all those. There's a lot of references to healing and miracles in the book of Acts. And also a lot of references to supernatural direction, where God or an angel or Jesus or just the Spirit says to somebody, go and do this or go over here and do that. So, like I said before, the book of Acts is a spirit-saturated book. Um, Second emphasis in the book of Acts is conversion. All about the converts. Let's take a look at that. On the day of Pentecost, I mentioned this before, uh, 3,000 people converted, chapter 2. In chapter 4, 5,000 people converted after healing a lame man at the temple. Uh, And it seems like whole towns convert. In uh, chapter 8, Samaria, a town in Samaria. In chapter 9, Lydda and Joppa. Uh, Then there are conversions of key people. There's the Ethiopian treasurer in chapter 8. Now that guy is a very significant guy. If you're in charge of the money for a country, you probably have connections. And becoming a, a Christian probably had an effect on his entourage and his people back home. Paul of Tarsus becomes a Christian in chapter 9. And then he becomes like the star of the show. (laughs) Like, you just don't, like, I know a lot of us as Christians, we're used to, like, we all know Paul's a Christian, but like, he didn't start as a Christian. He started as a persecutor, and then he flipped. I always think of Jesus as as kind of like looking down at Paul while he's like running around arresting all of his people. And And he kind of scratches his beard and says, You know, I could use somebody like that with that kind of tenacity. (laughs) Let's let's recruit him. Because Jesus literally appears to the guy, knocks him off his animal, blinds him with a light, and says, it's hard for you to kick against the pricks. It's like, what? (laughs) What are you going to do, buddy? And, uh, you know, Paul has an existential crisis and then works it around to believing. Unbelievable. 
Then we have Cornelius the Centurion in chapter 10, Sergius Paulus, the proconsul of Cyprus in chapter 13, Lydia, a wealthy Philippian merchant in chapter 16, Crispus, a synagogue leader in Corinth in chapter 8, and Publius of Malta in chapter 28. Probably not the only people in the book, just the ones that um, you know, came quickly. There, there are different elements to conversion experiences in the book of Acts. There are four main elements. There's faith, there's baptism, there's repentance, and there's receiving the Spirit. Typically, you don't get all four in any one specific incident. You'll get like faith and speaking in tongues, which is like receiving the Spirit. Or you'll get baptism and repentance. Or you'll get faith and nothing else, right? And, that, and it's not very systematized, but like if you look at all the conversions together, you'll come up with those four main elements. And that's the messiness of real ministry. It's not... And, and the ordering is different too, like... Sometimes they receive the Spirit before they get baptized or the other way, right? Um, so then we have, number three, perseverance through persecution. Man, there is a lot of persecution in the book of Acts. Holy smokes. The Sadducees arrest Peter and John in chapter 4. Then they arrest the apostles in chapter 5. A mob stones Stephen in chapter 7. Paul leads persecution in Jerusalem in chapter 8. King, King Herod executes James... <coughs> in chapter 12, and also imprisons Peter. The Jewish leaders expel Paul and Barnabas from Pisidian Antioch in chapter 13. Then they stone Paul at Lystra. And uh, to be stoned in the book of Acts has nothing to do with marijuana. It means somebody threw rocks at you until they thought you were dead, threw stones at you. Uh, the city magistrate, sorry, I just figured I'd say that just in case somebody watching this later, it's not, it's not, it's not you. It's just, you know, somebody could watch this later that maybe didn't know that. City magistrates arrest Paul and Silas in Philippi in chapter 16. A mob attacks Jason in chapter 17. Um, Paul gets accused in chapter 18. And, and then Paul, Paul uh, they, basically the, the proconsul there, a guy named Galio, Galio very exp important guy for dating. Because we actually know when he was the proconsul, in Corinth, and you're only a proconsul for a year or two, so this helps us to figure out the timeline for Paul and the missionary journeys, because we know when he was there, and then we can work out from there other dates. Um, then we have Demetrius instigating a riot in Ephesus, in chapter 19, a mob attacks Paul at, in chapter 20. You, you notice that Paul is getting persecuted a lot? Yeah. A lot, right? And then it keeps going and going. He gets arrested, and he has these trials and so forth. So there's a lot of persecution in the book of Acts, and yet nobody quits. Nobody. Not even one, there's not even one mention of a person who said, and the persecution was too much, so he stayed home. <laughs> no, that never happens. They just keep going and going. Maybe they'll flee. You know, it's, there's no... There's no like uh, suicide attempts where it's like, hey, I'm a Christian, kill me. There's none of that, you know, but there's either stay or flee. There is no sit down and quit. Then we have respect of authorities. I wonder if you thought about this while reading the book of Acts. There's an incredible amount of respect shown to Roman authorities in the book of Acts. And nobody ever challenges Roman authorities in the book of Acts. The persecutions that occur happen because of jealousy, and they happen from the Jewish uh, leaders, not from the Roman leaders. So Paul is, respective, Paul is respectful to his arresting officer, Claudius, in chapter 21. He asserts his Roman citizenship. Paul's a good Roman citizen. He cordially converses with Felix, the governor of Judea. Paul appeals to have a trial before Caesar, and the Roman authorities grant it. Paul interacts respectfully with Festus and King Agrippa and a couple of their wives, too. King Agrippa says Paul should have been set free. So you have Roman authorities that are saying, oh, this guy shouldn't even be arrested. right? So the, the impression you get, O oh, Theophilus, Mr. Roman authority, is that these Christians aren't a threat to the Roman Empire. There's no need to persecute them. You see, you see how that, the book would accomplish that goal? 
which obviously is an important goal for us early on. Paul complies on the whole journey while under, under arrest. Which brings us to the Gentiles. The Gentiles is it's, it's a major, major controversy in the book of Acts. What do we do with these people? What do, and what are Gentiles? Anyone that's not Jewish. So basically everyone is a Gentile, except for the Jewish people. And these people start believing in Jesus. And it's really kind of undeniable that God's behind it because who is the person that first brings Christianity to the Gentiles? Is first Philip with this guy in Ethiopia. Then it's Peter with this uh, Italian soldier. And then you have these others preaching in Antioch and they start preaching to the Greeks and they believe. And then Paul goes on his trips and all these Gentiles. And it's just like, it starts like a little bit here, like, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll allow the Ethiopian because he went home to Ethiopia. We don't have to deal with him and figure out how to, you know, be a community with him. Oh, we could deal with Cornelius. He's no big deal. He's just going to stay in Caesarea. He's got his Roman life. You know, we don't need to worry about him. He's, he's an Italian. He'll be with the Italians, right? But then in Antioch, in Antioch, something new happens. Christian Jews and Christian non-Jews start having community together, start having meals together. And the big question comes up, do we need to, do we, do Gentiles need to keep the law? Do Gentiles need to become Jews? They need to get circumcised. They need to, they need to become Jews in order to be Christians. This is a big question in the book of Acts. And it's not, it's not a really straightforward answer at first. Now, let me, add, let, me, let me add one other thing to this, something you might not have heard of before, and that is the God-fearers. This is, a, this is a kind of a special term we see in the book of Acts, and the way I want you to think of it is you have all these different cities that Paul visits, and Paul loves cities, by the way. He's not so much into the country. He wants to go to the city, and he wants to go to the biggest city in the area. He is not afraid. Paul is a first-rate uh, what's, what, the term would be rhetorician, somebody who is educated and skilled at the art of persuading other people. And he knows it. And he's taking advantage of it. And he is, he is going to speak in such a way that the people in the synagogue are going to be like, well, man, is this, I don't know if I agree with him, but I sure do like how he sounds. You know, and then he goes over here to the school of Tyrannus, and he's over here in the marketplace in Athens. He's up there debating with the philosophers, holding his own. Right? So, I mean, this is, this is not somebody that's, like, easy to combat. You know, I, I, think, I think Jesus was like, you know, like, let's just flip that guy. He could do a lot of good. Anyhow, so Paul's there, and he goes from town to town to town. And he always does the same thing. He starts in the synagogue, and he preaches in the synagogue. And there's not just Jewish people in the synagogue. He's not, he's not in Jerusalem, he's not in Judea, he's not in Galilee, he's, he's in Macedonia, he's in Achaia, he's in Galatia, he's in all these other regions, Pamphylia, Amphipolis, you know, he's all these other places. And so he starts in the synagogue, and he preaches, and it, and it says there are Jews, and then it says there are God-fearers. God-fearers are Gentiles who are interested in the Jewish scriptures and are interested in the Jewish God, and who are hanging around the synagogue, but they haven't converted. And here comes this guy through town who says, you can become a Christian, and you don't have to become a Jew. Do you think that might cause some jealousy among the people who are like, no, really, you should become a Jew and be, join the synagogue, right? So he's giving these God-fearers an easy way into a relationship with God through Jesus Christ that is not available to them unless they convert to Judaism. And if they're God-fearers, they're, they're, they, you know, they fear God, they worship God, but they're not following the law of Moses. So Christianity is incredibly attractive to this uh, group of people. So, 
Much of this is worked out in the epistles of Paul, the theology. But what ends up happening is Acts 15, verse 1. Then certain individuals came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to discuss this question with the apostles and the elders. So there's a Jerusalem church, which is at this time no longer led by Peter. I'm not really sure where Peter is at the time of Acts 15. I mean, he's there, but it doesn't seem like he's calling the shots. James the brother of Jesus is calling the shots. And he is dealing with this, this, uh, what, uh, controversy, this strife. And you have all these Jews that believe in Jesus, and they all keep the law. And then you have all these Gentiles who are now believe in Jesus, and they don't keep the law. And the question is, well, don't we have to make them keep the law? And what they decide after deliberation is, no, they don't have to keep the law. They can remain Gentiles, and they can be full members of the family of God. And a lot of this depends on the Spirit as well, which I can't really get into, but because God had testified that He had accepted them through giving them the Spirit, the the people had to say, well, I guess God accepted them. I guess we'll accept them. This was a massive decision. Think about it for a moment. If this decision had not happened in Acts chapter 15... Christianity would not have spread so far and so fast. It was spread about as far and fast as Judaism has spread. Because it would just be Judaism that also believed in Jesus. But instead, Christianity is able to spread without converting people to the law of Moses. Now, like the historical books of the Old Testament, Acts provides the spine into which many of the vertebrae of the epistles fit. And so as Paul travels from place to place in the book of Acts, we get familiarized with these locations that eventually get letters written to them. So in his second missionary journey, he goes to Ephesus. He goes to Galatia. He goes to Philippi and Thessalonica and to Corinth. And then we look in other parts of our New Testament and we see a letter to the Corinthians and a letter to the Ephesians and a letter to the Thessalonians and so forth. So these trips that Paul makes to these places can help us, and we'll we'll talk about this later next time, but when we are reading the epistles, the church epistles in particular, sometimes we can go to the book of Acts and see how that church started. And that can be helpful. All right. On to my last major point, which is prescriptive or descriptive. Acts Is Acts prescribing how you should live or describing what they did? You know what a prescription is at a doctor? A doctor gives you a prescription that he's telling you what to do. He's saying, take, take two of these and call me in the morning. Right? They never say that. It's just in the movies. Whereas a description is like what news reporters do. They describe what happened in a particular situation. One exercises authority over you, and the other just informs you. And so the question about the book of Acts is descriptive or prescriptive. It says in Acts chapter 2, verse 44, all who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent time, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts. If all of Acts is prescriptive, then all Christians should practice voluntary communism. That's what this is. You see that, right? It even has the word common there. All right, so they're holding everything in common. They're selling their possessions and they're distributing as any has need. This presents some some challenges. Fee and Stewart say, 
unless Scripture explicitly tells us we must do something, what is only narrated or described does not function in a normative, i.e. obligatory way, unless it can be demonstrated on other grounds that the author intended it to function in this way. So Acts is not telling you what you have to do as a Christian. It's telling you what they did do as Christians. Now, it doesn't mean that it doesn't have a relevance to your life because the miracles in Acts tells us, in if I could just pick one thing, like the miracles, they tell us what's possible. And I don't think we should just like brush that aside and be like, oh, well, that was just them. We don't need to pursue any kind of miracles in our lives today. No, I, I don't think that's an appropriate thing to do. I also don't think it's appropriate for you to go to a hospital and cast your shadow upon the sick because somebody in the book of Acts did that and it healed those people, so obviously it must work for you. Now look, if God's leading you to do that, go for it. But you can't just imitate exactly what they did. You can't like just establish communism and start blessing aprons and think that everyone's going to be healed. God has to lead you just like he led them in that situation. How about this one? Peter rebukes Ananias and Sapphira. They drop dead. <laughs> or Peter healed the, the sick with the shadow. I mentioned that. How about this? Paul miraculously blinded Elymas on Cyprus. It was, it's a reverse healing. He could see, and then he couldn't see. He called him the son of the devil, and he said, you're going to be blind for a season. Well, that shows you what's possible, but it doesn't guarantee that as Christians, this is part of our ministry, that on like Thursday nights, there's like blinding services that people are invited to attend. You know, that's just ridiculous. People in Ephesus touched a handkerchief and then touched it to Paul's skin, and it made demons flee out of people. These are things that happened. So they, I think, again, it's, it's descriptive, not prescriptive, but that doesn't mean it couldn't happen again today if God is still alive and there is a, a need and a situation and there's a willing person who has faith. Why couldn't something like this still happen today? All right, let's review. Acts is a history of the church that Luke wrote to follow his biography of Christ. Acts describes the spread of Christianity from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the ends of the earth. And by the ends of the earth, they mean the Mediterranean world, okay? They didn't have our sense of how big the world is yet. In Acts, Luke is interested in the activity of the Spirit, conversions, persecution, and how Christians are respectful to Roman authorities. The inclusion of the Gentiles into the early Christian movement caused a significant controversy, resulting in the decision that they did not need to keep the law in order to become Christian. Acts provides the historical backbone into which fit many of the epistles of the New Testament. Luke tells of Paul's three missionary journeys as well as his final treacherous journey to Rome under arrest. Although Acts shows us what is possible as we walk with God, it does not prescribe that Christians today must do everything the way they did it. It's descriptive, not prescriptive. Now, I do want to mention something else about the book of Acts, just so I actually have a couple of, I have about one minute extra. So I'm going to use it, okay? In the book of Acts, unlike any other book of the Bible, there are so many places, so many locations mentioned. It's really helpful to read it with a map. It's really helpful to read it with a map. Otherwise, these, like you'll read, you'll come across these city names and you'll just be like, blah, 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 blah. No, these are real places and they exist on this planet and you can go to most of them. And I recommend you do that at some point in your life, that you take a Bible lands tour. You've done it. Some of us have, have gone to some of these places. 
And when you go there, you, you see how the sun is in that location. You see what the rocks look like, and you see what kind of plants grow there, and you see the ruins. And this is a whole enterprise. It's a big, big area of scholarship called archaeology, where they have dug at these sites. Did you know that there was a city buried by a volcano in the year 79? Talk about a time capsule that can help us imagine what city life was like in the first century. Isn't that tremendous? It's called Pompeii. You can go to Pompeii and you can see the walls. You can see, and, so, and because of how everything got buried, they're able to, to blow casts of the, of the people who died. You can see the, the positions they were in. You can even see their clothing. And they have had science, this is going to blow your mind. They've had scientists examine the latrines to see what kind of bacteria and what kind of food they ate and what kind of diseases they had, and they studied the bones. I mean, the amount of knowledge we have about the first century in the Roman Empire is a lot. And so there are Christian resources that you can use, and non-Christian resources as well, to learn about these places and learn about this time period. And we'll come back to that in a, future, in a future session. That brings this teaching on Acts to an end. Next time we'll look at the epistles. Instead of just taking all the epistles as one, I'm going to break them into three sections. The church epistles, the pastoral epistles, and the general epistles. And, you know, these are some, the epistles are some of the most quoted and significant books of the entire New Testament. So that's, this is going to be awesome. So that's what we'll do next as we continue in our class, Read the Bible for Yourself. Mm -hmm.